Okay, so we prayed on Wednesday night, we prayed on Thursday morning, we were using Psalm 103, and I want to read it over us today as we begin our worship time. Uh, we listened to a, a clip from Stephanie Gretzinger, some of you know her, she's a, a songwriter, worship leader, um, and we listened to her share some thoughts about worship, and one of the things, she said some really powerful things, but one of the things I, I wrote down on my phone and she was talking about worship teams and those that are worshiping in the congregation. She said, we've become addicted to the response of those in front of us, talking about those that are in the congregation and those that are on the worship team. Then she said, the reverse, we've become addicted to a room responding to us. She said, we get addicted to expression and then we have nothing left to take home. She's like, she said, you know, we come in and we're dry, we're empty, and we come in to get filled up. Like, we need the oil of God, we need the presence of God. She's like, what if we came already filled up and we came to worship? And it wasn't about needing the power of the worship team, like having to hide behind the drums or the atmosphere of the guitar line or whatever else, you know. Like, we have this expression and sort of these crutches that we lean on. And so she's saying what happens is we come into a room and there's this energy and that's what we look for. And that's what we lean on. And she's like, no, we should be looking at a person, not on a feeling or an atmosphere that's created, but on Jesus. And that can get kind of confusing. That's kind of a nuanced thing because, yes, there's an environment where our emotions get stirred. Yes, music pulls you know, something out of our soul. That is a reality. But those are secondary things. And it's got to be about Jesus. The focus and priority has to be on Him, bringing glory to His name, surrendering to Him. It can't be about all the accoutrements. And anyway, that was just a powerful statement. And she said this She said, Purity of worship is compromised when it becomes about us. It's not about us, our preferences, what we're used to. Once again, it's about Him and pouring our love upon Him. And so Psalm 103 really highlights this. And so let's read it together. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. Once again, that's why we're here, to bless the Lord. All that's within us, to give Him our best, to give Him highest praises, because He's worthy. Now, here's all his benefits, and this is what I've been praying, the promises of God, wanting to release this over our church, over our body. Forget none of his benefits, verse 3, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. So we just went through this line by line on Wednesday night. Who pardons your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Now look, he heals how many of your iniquities? Come on, somebody. How many of your diseases? All. Oh. Who redeems your life from the pit, or who rescues you from destruction, some translations will say. And he doesn't just do that. He says he crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Thank you, Lord. You pull us out of the pit and save us from destruction, and you crown us with loving kindness and compassion. This is who our God is. This is how he treats us. Verse 5. Who satisfies your ears with good things. Sam translation says, satisfies your mouth with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. So those were the five verses that we focused on and we've been praying. But I want to go on and read some more of this. Look at verse 6. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate. Notice this compassion and this loving kindness is constantly repeated through here. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Verse 10, this is good news. He has not dealt with us according to our sin, nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. Somebody say amen. amen. This phrase, toward those who fear him, notice how this gets, this gets repeated now. Moving on, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, 
So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Thank you, Lord. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on who? Those who fear him. That word is the word revere, who stand in awe of him, who honor him as Lord, as king. Verse 14, for he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledge it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Once again, on who? On those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. Verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord. Here we go. We started with bless the Lord, O my soul, and we're ending with it. Bless the Lord, you his angels. So it's not just little old me. Bless the Lord, you his angels. There's a heaven re reality that we're joining in with. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That's why we're here, isn't it? To bless the Lord. That's it. That's the reason why we gathered here, to bless the Lord. And I want us to walk in the fear of the Lord. I, I want us to have an awe and a reverence. I want us to treat this Sunday, this, this is the last sort of week and a half of our fast. It's been a sacred time before the Lord. It's been a consecrated time. So let's just say, God, whatever you want to do, we, we want you to finish the work. We want you to continue it on. That this hasn't been just another year where we started with fasting and prayer but that you marked us, that there's an impact and impression that's been made for us to reset ourselves and realign and get back to the heart of worship, get back to the one thing, that the first commandment would be first place, that we would be baptized in first love, revelation, and anointing. Like, that's what we're doing. We're recalibrating, and we have to do that from time to time in our lives as individuals and as a church, as a family, whatever. And that's all we, what this month has been about. At the first of 2024, let's recalibrate. Let's let God do an inner work in us. And so whatever your level of seeking God, of participating in the fast or not, that's okay. Today's a brand new day. He's compassionate. He's merciful. He wants to meet with you. He wants to pour out on those who fear his name. So let's drop the fear of man. Let's drop whatever's happened in the past. Let's drop whatever we're thinking about in the future. And let's just walk before him in the fear of the Lord. Let's say, God, it's this moment that we're presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. This is our reasonable service of worship to you. Find us faithful worshipers that worship in spirit and in truth because we know you're seeking those ones. God, would you find us here? So I'm just expressing my heart, like I said, on this last Sunday of the fast. Let's press in a little bit more. Let's give him more. Yes, we're asking God to do more, but let's give him more. Let's bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Amen? I'm going to be in 2 Samuel if you want to turn there. I'm going to look again at the life of David. I've been provoked to go back to the life of David. There's two situations in David's life. I want to set the stage for you here. David's had this long journey of being the shepherd boy anointed by Samuel to be king. He's seen his best friend that he made a covenant with, son of Saul, Jonathan, get killed. He's had all of this turmoil. He's had Saul trying to end his life. He's uh, just had this battle throughout, even though he had the promise of God, the anointing of God, all of that. They had this season of having to trust God and to wait on God and to allow God to move and reveal his purposes and his ways at the right time. And so he, he finally is able to take the throne. He's able to take Zion back. He's able to win some battles. The people are behind him. God is establishing his kingdom. 
And he's able to get the Ark of the Covenant back from the Philistines. He's ready to put the presence of God at the center of the kingdom. He's wanting to worship and celebrate. He's about to set singers and musicians their full-time occupation to be in the temple, worshiping and praising and ministering before the Lord. And he's in this mode of awe and just extravagant pouring out of his heart to dance before the Lord. And they're taking some steps and they're stopping and they're sacrificing and they're taking some steps and stopping and sacrificing on this journey of taking the Ark of the Covenant to its rightful place, Mount Zion. And so this is where we see David at the, at the height of his passion for the Lord, of his engaging in worship. It's his, he's won all these battles, he's engaged in all this warfare, but this is his warfare. This is his victory dance. This is the march that matters. This is his priority. This is his obsession. And so we see this in his life, and then things settle down, and it's time to go back out. It actually says, and we're going to read it in a minute, that it was the time when kings go out to battle, and David didn't go out. He sent his men and said, I'm going to stay here nice and comfy. I've settled it in. It's all good. We're set up here. I'm just going to lay back now and take it easy. And you know what happens when he does that? He decides to get up off his couch. He's just kind of complacent, doing his thing. It's all good. I've got a history in God. I'm a, I'm, I'm a worshiping warrior. But he sat back in this journey that David got taken on. The enemy exploited him when he got complacent. He got confident in the flesh. And this, what does he do? He goes out on his roof and he looks out and who does he see? Bathsheba. I want to look at these moments in David's life. So let's look at this in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Like I said, I want to take us through some prayer. Starting in verse 14. David was dancing before the Lord with all his strength. What does it look like? For David, the warrior king, to dance before the Lord with all his strength. David was wearing a linen ephod. Now, the Bible, why would the Bible say that? He's dancing before the Lord. Who cares what he's wearing? The Bible says stuff on purpose. It's not an accident. You know what? A linen ephod is what the priests wore. <laughs> so here's David. He's representing what it is to be a king and to be a priest. What does it look like? How do you present yourself to the Lord? David is saying, hey, the presence of God is back in our midst. And we're going to exalt him. We're going to pour out our worship. That the, Our kingdom is going to be about him and his rule and his reign and his dominion. We're submitting to his will. David is making sure that this is the priority. This is the centrality of how we're going to order our lives before God. He's representing what it is to be a king and a priest before God. And what is he doing? He's worshiping like a madman. He's dancing, but he's making a fool of himself, really. And he admits that later. And he says, I'll demean myself. I'll become even more undignified than this. Because he had his critics, didn't he? How can a king act like that? How can someone who's about to ordain the priesthood and the singers and musicians. No, he was setting the right example. <laughs> but the religious and the different ones weren't so sure about it. But I'm telling you, God has called us to be kings and priests. And David is showing us what it looks like. How we posture ourselves. How we should be worshiping. With all of our strength. Not worrying about anybody else's viewpoint, opinion, whatever else, criticism, religious, whatever, doesn't matter. Verse 15, so David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord. So I like that. David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with joyful shouting and the sound of the trumpet. I don't even know that when you blow a trumpet, it's loud, 
right? It's a loud sound. Why would they blow a trumpet in biblical times? There are multiple reasons. But a lot of times it's because you're announcing that a king is coming. There's a coronation ceremony. There's, there's something that's happened that they're celebrating. Here's the king. He's making an announcement, a declaration. He's entering into the city. You would blow the trumpet because you were gathering for war. The enemy's on the horizon. Let's gather the people. The watchmen are blowing the trumpet. It's time to prepare for battle. Right? You blow the trumpet when they had feasts, when there was something to celebrate. They would blow the trumpet. There was a sound to draw people into worship, into this joyful, celebratory, exuberant devotion to the Lord, to remind them of who God is and what He had done. This is what we're here to declare. Sound a trumpet. Let's make a noise about it. Let's be loud. Let's let as many people hear it and see it as possible who our God is. We're not going to be afraid. We're not going to be ashamed. We're going to shout it from the rooftops. David was leading the house of Israel were with him with joyful shouting and the sound of the trumpet. This is powerful worship. It's the same thing for us. David was simply saying, the Lord is in our midst. The Lord is good and he's greatly to be praised. We're going to exalt him for him to take his rightful place and he would have the preeminence in all things. Is that not what we get to do? Is the Lord not in our midst? Do we not want to see him exalted? Is he not moved on our behalf and given us victory and freedom over and over and over? Do we not have a history like David? Where's our worship like this? With all our strength, with the sound. The shouting with the victorious, with the overcoming. God wants an overcoming bride, a passionate bride that's equally yoked to him in love. That's not quiet. That is bold. It's, I'm, not, I'm not saying for us to just be crazy and for the sake of, of, of volume. I'm not saying that. But I am saying a wholeheartedness is what I'm saying. What an honor, what a privilege that we get to come before the Lord as kings and priests. Verse 16. Then it happened, as the ark of the Lord was coming into the city of David, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, listen to this. She looked down through the window. She's looking down on David's worship. She saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she was contemptuous of him in her heart. Contemptuous. Uh, we usually associate this word as like a legal term that a judge would use. You're in his courtroom, he has authority, and you do something that the judge doesn't like, and you disrupt the proceedings, what's the judge going to say? I'm going to hold you in contempt. contempt. You're in contempt of court. You've treated the court with disrespect. You've dishonored it. And so I'm going to have to treat you with hostility. And this is what's happening with Michael. She's passing a judgment on David. She's looking down at him through her window, through her perch, through her high and lofty position. And she's the queen, right? She's like, we're supposed to be royalty and you're out there she makes this commentary. Let's look at what all she says. Verse 20. Skip down. But when David returned to bless his own household. So David is looking forward to going in with his wife and saying, isn't this amazing? I want to bless us and our marriage and, and what God is doing. He's ready to go in. And like, he's excited to share this moment. David returned to bless his own household. Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. And said, how the king of Israel dignified himself today. Are you, are you catching the sarcasm that's here? How the king of Israel dignified himself today. What a great display. What a show. Way to go, David. For he, listen to what she says. He exposed himself today in the sight of his servants, female slaves. As one, now she even says as one of the rabble shamelessly exposes himself. 
you know what I like about David? He's like, you're right. <laughs> I did act undignified. I ought to be myself and become even more undignified than this. And it's okay. If you don't honor this or you're not going to come into agreement with this, let the female servants and let the rabble that you talked about, those ones that know what it is to be in a lowly position and have to depend on the Lord. Those ones that are poor in spirit. Those ones that are hungry. Those ones that recognize right, the King of glory and how He saved them. How He's forgiven them. I, I want to celebrate with them. Those that were, yeah, sure. David's like, yeah, I, I'm rabble too. I was just a shepherd boy. I don't know what God has done. So I'll worship with them. You can stay up in the high castle with your opinion and your judgment and your criticism. I'll just be down with the lowly and broken and the hungry ones worshiping. That's what David says. I don't know about you, but I was addicted to self, right? Selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed before I came to know Jesus. And God saved me from myself. Saved me multiple times from paths of destruction. Where I was caring about all the wrong things. Any of us in this room know where we were in the depths of our sin and our addiction and all of that junk that we were in. And God came and pulled us out of that pit. God came and shined his light. Is there anybody else in this room that that's your experience? Where's our worship? Where's our undignified proclamation? Even in front of our family members, right? Who cares? Verse 21, but David said to Michael, I was before the Lord. And I believe he's even referring, I was before the Lord in my watching over sheep days. When my brothers didn't care about me, my father didn't even bring me to the table when they were going to search for a king. I wasn't even thought about. But I was before the Lord, even then. I was before the Lord, listen to this, who preferred me to your father. I mean, he just goes straight for the jugular. And to all his house, to appoint me as ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. So I will celebrate before the Lord. Come on, somebody. I will celebrate. The Lord has appointed and anointed me. I'm telling you, man, the caller is also the keeper. He calls you. He keeps you. He enables you. He empowers you. He doesn't abandon you. He's faithful to his word to complete the work that he began in you. David knew this. I will celebrate before the Lord, verse 22, and I might demean myself or become even more undignified, your translation might say. I might demean myself even more than this. Listen to what he says. And be lowly even in my own sight. But with the female slaves of whom you have spoken with them, I'm to be held in honor. And listen to this. The very end, verse 23. Once again, the Bible doesn't say anything on accident. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. What is the lesson to be learned here? What is the principle? That spirit of religion and pride and criticism will lead you to spiritual barrenness. That's what will happen. You decide that, man, that's, you know, whatever. And sometimes it may not be, you might not be critical of the worship here or a person or the style, or the song selection, or whatever it is, you may be just critical of yourself. And you're like, I can't worship. God, you don't know. Justin, you don't know that. I know that God's a redeemer. And I know that he cleanses all of our iniquity. I know that the blood has paid it all. And it's, a front, it's an affront to the cross to say, I can't worship extravagantly. I can't worship passionately. I can't shout. I can't dance and leap before the Lord. Yes, you can. There's no condemnation. There's no shame in Jesus. I don't care if you messed up yesterday. I don't care if you got high and you're drunk coming into this room. There's redemption. There's freedom. There's cleansing in the blood of Jesus. (laughs) 
And all I'm saying is, I don't want to be spiritually barren. I don't want to judge myself wrongly or judge others. I don't want to have religious spirit. I don't want to have pride. I want to come in and make my boast in the Lord. I want to be loud and proud about it. And I want it to be pure. I want it to be holy. But I believe the Lord wants to break some of this off. And we wonder, you know, why am I not seeing fruit? Why am I not hearing God's voice or sensing his presence or getting this answer or this direction or whatever it is? A lot of times it's because of pride and religion and criticism and judgment, offense, whatever it is, hardness of heart. We're not able to worship the Lord, and so we just stay locked up. We just stay trapped. We just stay in our little pity party. We just stay in our little box. We look down from our window, and we're looking down at the people and the problems instead of looking up at Jesus. God's saying, come out of that place. Come out of the window. Come down into humility. into the place of brokenness. Because that's the thing. Here's what we're talking about with David. We're talking about spiritual barrenness. And we're about to move to spiritual boredom. But David had brokenness. We can get through and deal with the barrenness and the boredom if we have brokenness like David. So let's look at this. I actually turn over to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. A few chapters over. But before we do that, I want to read you a different translation of David's answer to Michael. It's actually the Jewish translation of the Old Testament. It puts it in a pretty amazing way. Listen to what his answer is in the Jewish translation. Since David answered her, did I make Mary before a flesh and blood king? I made Mary before the king of kings who chose me from among your father and all his house. If your father had been more righteous than I, would God have chosen me and rejected your father's house? Listen to this. In your father's house, they stood upon their own honor instead of the honor of heaven. But as for me, I do not do so. I disregard my own honor and stand upon the honor of heaven. Wow. That's it right there. That gets to the heart of the matter. Saul and, and your family, is what David says, they stood upon their own honor, which is what you're trying to do right now, Michael. David said, but as for me, I disregard my own honor and stand upon the honor of heaven. David's like, who cares about me and my honor as the king and what other people are thinking about me and my royalty and my properness? <laughs> who cares about all that? I love it. He's like, I'm going to honor heaven. Whether I receive any honor or not, I'm going to make it about heaven. I'm going to make it about him. So that's where we want to be. We don't want to be in 2 Samuel 11. Spiritual boredom. Look at what happens, starting in verse 1. Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle. David should have been going out to battle. But David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they brought destruction on the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. It was time to be active. It was time to pursue the will of the Lord. It was time to be obedient. This, this was the season that it was supposed to be in. David said, no thanks. I'll let the other guys do it. I'm going to sit back. David gets complacent. That's what happens. So here, here we go, verse 2. So it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch. He's just lounging around. And he was walking on the roof of the king's house. All right, I'm sitting on my couch. I had a little snack. I'm just going to go and walk on the roof. I don't know. What are you doing walking on the roof? He's walking on the roof of the king's house and he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. So he sees Bathsheba, Bathsheba 
And obviously, it must have been a pretty long look. He didn't just stop at looking. He actually sent his servants to go and find out about her. Man, she looks really great. I'm going to find out about this, this girl. The servants go and inquire and come back and, and tell David that she's married and who she's married to and all of this. And David still says, okay, that's great. Send for her. Bring her to me. This progression happens. All of a sudden, David's guard is down. He's spiritually bored. What happens when that happens? You become complacent. You become vulnerable. And fleshly desires come in and you're desensitized to what's happening around you. All of a sudden, you make excuses. You make justifications. The voice of the Lord is really distant. And it's okay. You know, whatever. I deserve this, you know. I fought my battles. It's time for me to kick back. I don't have to rely on the Lord like I once did. He's established me now. It's all good. Obviously, it wasn't all good, was it? David didn't just look at her. He didn't just inquire about her. He didn't just sin for her. He sleeps with her, impregnates her, and then he's got a problem. Now I'm going to have to deal with this. So then he goes to try to cover it up. And he tries to bring back one of his soldiers who's out of war, which is where David should have been with his men all along. He brings one of his, this guy back. He says, hey, man, I want you to have a time, and I appreciate your service. Go ahead and be with your wife. Go ahead and just relax, take it easy, get your mind off things. And he was an honorable man, and he said, I'm not going to go and sleep with my wife and take it easy while the men are out there on the battlefield. I'm not going to do it. This is what he said to David. David was like, dang, I needed him to do that. He's going to figure out that his wife is pregnant and it's not his. So what does he do? He tells his people, hey, send that guy to the front line tomorrow morning. Make sure he's at the very front of the battle. What happens? He gets killed. Think about the progression that happened here. Just a few chapters earlier, David was at the peak, right, of pursuing the Lord. And now all of a sudden, he's down in the depths of murder. Nathan the prophet has to come to him and say, hey man, I need to tell you this story. He tells him this story about a man who stole some sheep from somebody else and did all this crazy stuff. And Nathan was like, what do you think should happen to that man? David was like, man, that guy needs to be punished. He needs to do this and do that. And Nathan says, you're that man, David. You're that man. What you did with Bathsheba. And David goes into this travail. David goes into this brokenness, into this place where he doesn't eat or drink for three days. And he's praying that his son will live. She was pregnant. He's praying that God would spare the child. And he's in this state of utter brokenness before the Lord. The child doesn't live. And David, in the midst of that, actually writes Psalm 51. In the midst of this situation, where he knows he's absolutely blown it, where God has given him everything up to this point, and then he betrayed it all. One moment of lustful desire. He got spiritually bored. And all of a sudden, sin entered in. You know, that's what God said to Cain. Didn't he? he said, you know what? Sin is crouching at the door and it wants to overtake you. But you can master it. <laughs> that's, what, that's what God said. You don't have to let it come in and dominate you. It's crouching at the door. How do you know that's what the devil is? He prowls around as a roaring light, seeking whom he may devour. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we're made for war. And the moment that we decide to stop warring and to stop pressing in and to stop being hungry and to stop worshiping and to just take it easy, this is the potential of what could happen. I want you to turn to Psalm 51. We're going to look at this. This is David's prayer in the midst of this situation. Now, before we read Psalm 51, 
want us to pray. I want us to pray about spiritual barrenness, about spiritual boredom. So I'm just going to ask you guys to just stand to your feet. I just want us to stand together. I want us to engage in prayer. I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to focus. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about anything else. Now I'm going to pray, but I want you to pray. I want us to engage together in prayer. And whether or not this is something that has affected you right now or in the past, it may affect you in the future, Whether whatever, we're going to pray for ourselves, we're going to pray for each other, pray for this church, pray for the church in general. We need the spirit of religion broken off of the church. The works of man, man-centered stuff, all the compromise that's happening to the, cult, to, to the culture, all the bowing down. All the, the watering down of the gospel, all the seeker friendly, you know, whatever just junk that's there, the way that the world has come into the church. Instead of the church shaping culture, the culture has shaped us. We need to repent. We need the spirit of religion to go for it to be broken off. We need the judgmental, pharisaical thing where believers are looking at other believers and looking at this leader and criticizing this and saying that worship and this. Wanting to judge the theology of every worship song and how they baptize and speaking in tongues and this and that. That's got to go. God wants a unified, pure and spotless bride focused on Jesus, on the cross, on his return, on advancing the kingdom. He wants a spiritually violent people that are hungry, that are going after him, that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Without religion, without criticism, without judgment, that's bearing the fruits of repentance, the fruits of righteousness, the gifts and fruits. Come on, let's pray. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus, in my own heart, Lord, break off the religion. Any walls that I have up, any fear of man, go in the name of Jesus. I want to walk in the fear of the Lord before you. I don't want it to be picture perfect. I don't want to have the pretty words. I don't want to have the structure perfect. God, I know you give order, you give design and all of that, but I want to throw that out the window if you say to. I want to obey. I want to go with the flow. I want freedom in the spirit. I want to walk with you where you're leading. I don't want religion. I don't want routine. I don't want to impress people. Break it off of me. Break it off of this church. Break it off of your church, God. The criticism, the judgmental spirit, the discord that gets sowed. When expectations are not met, or whatever it is, when we should be doing this, or, or whatever it is, break it off. Bring us to unity. Humble us, God. No, let the pride go in Jesus' name. Man-centeredness go in Jesus' name. That it would be God-centered. That we would say, we're going to not stand on our own honor, but the honor of heaven. We disregard our own honor in the name of Jesus. We yoke ourselves to you in meekness and in loneliness. We were jacked up. We were broken. We were slaves, but you set us free. And now we want to worship you without religion, without pride, without judgment. We don't want to be condemned. We, don't, we can be free of guilt and shame. Freedom in the name of Jesus. Freedom to worship extravagantly. To sound the trumpets, to shout, to dance, to sing. To pray and to release and decree and declare as sons and daughters who you made us to be, warriors that you made us to be. Oh, Father, the barrenness. We pray, God, we want fruit and fruit that remains. We want to connect to your heart, to abide in Christ and in your word, so that the fruits of the Spirit would come forth. Love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, gentleness, self-control. We need it, God. We need it, God. We want to operate in the fullness of our gift and calling. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge come forth. The prophetic visions and dreams. We don't want to be spiritually barren. We don't want to be detached and on the sidelines. Oh, God. We're not trying to compare ourselves. We don't need jealousy. We don't need competition. We need humility and purity and unity. Oh, Father, let it be so in Jesus' name. Break through the spiritual barrenness. 
break through the spiritual portal, of God. We need a hunger. Would you create in us a hungry heart? A hungry heart, God, that would go after you day and night and night and day. That would not compromise. That we would give ourselves. Oh, Father, it's not about our giftedness. It's about our givenness. Oh, we surrender. Oh, Father, break off the portal. We want to engage with you. We want to advance your kingdom. We want to see signs and wonders and miracles released. We want to sit back and take it easy. You train us for battle. You train our hands for war. You made us for war. We are in warfare. Oh, God, break off the apathy. Break off the complacency. We don't want to be defenseless. We don't want to be vulnerable to the attacks and the schemes of the enemy. Oh, God, break off the selfish desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Break it off of us. Spiritual barrenness and spiritual boredom, that's not our portion. It has to go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Psalm 51, Psalm 51, you can be seated. We're going to pray again, so don't turn it off. It's okay. Just You can speak in tongues under your breath. It's okay. Pray in the Spirit. It's okay. You can listen with your spirit. Don't disengage. Psalm 51 is what we need. We need this prayer of David to come forward. So what happens in the first few verses of Psalm 51 is David admits the depths of sin that he's engaged in. He acknowledges the depths of sin. His, his own shortcoming and failing. It's against you and you alone. It's my iniquity. It was my desire. It was me, Lord. It's no one else. He acknowledges the depths of his sin, but then he acknowledges the heights of God's love. The heights of God's love and forgiveness and mercy and compassion. He recognizes both. My sin, but God, your goodness. And David even though he's been brought to this point, after all that God has done, and then he, he threw it away, he fell, he still has, listen to me, absolute faith and confidence in the mercy and forgiveness of God. We need to have that every time we fall, every time we fall short, because we're going to do it. We are. But we have to return to absolute faith and confidence in the mercy and forgiveness of God. Yes, the depths of my sin and flesh and brokenness and my past and everything else. But God and his mercy and his love and his forgiveness is so much bigger than that. So much more powerful than that. I'm not going to allow my sin and the flesh and the world and the devil to overtake me. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. I'm a warrior like David. I'm a worshiping warrior. It's what I was made for. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give up. So we see God's faithfulness and compassion. We see David's sin and brokenness and his acknowledgement and confession. It's so key. It's so key that we acknowledge and we confess both our sin and God's faithfulness and compassion. Then we see God's desire for truth in the innermost being. God has a desire for truth in our innermost being. For us just to be real and raw and open before him. Just laid bare, just transparent vulnerable in his presence. And then David, so we see God's faithfulness and compassion, David's sin and brokenness. We see God's desire for truth, and we see David's desire to be cleansed and purified. And that's where we're going to pick it up in verse 10. What does David cry out for? He says, create in me a clean heart. David say, I, I need it to be new again. I need it to be brand new. I need you to create it. Create it, God. My heart is deceitfully wicked. And I'm broken. I need you to completely restore. Create in me a clean heart, God, and renew a steadfast spirit. I got bored. I got complacent. I want to be steady, God. Restore me to steadiness. I don't want to get into a cycle where I continue to sin. and then Break it off me now. Break it off me now. Yes. I don't want to continue in this. Set me back on the right course. Renew a steadfast spirit. I'm not going to make excuses. I'm not going to be, woe is me. No, I'm going for it now. 
Create in me a clean heart, God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. I can't live without your presence, God, is what David says. Take the kingdom, let people say whatever they want, but i got to have you. Do not take your Holy Spirit. I know you're holy, and I can only be holy if I'm in communion with you. I've got to have you. Be with me, Lord, even in this darkest hour. Take the wealth, take the fame, the reputation. Don't take your presence. Look at the desperation. Here's the king. Here, here, here he is demeaning himself now like he said he would, isn't he? This undignified prayer. This isn't a kingly prayer. This is a jacked up, sobbing, ugly cry, pour it out prayer. I mean, if I was, you know, David, I'd be like, can we keep this one out of the book? Can we just skim over that one and go to the other? God in his wisdom, it, it made it. It made it to thank God it made it to the Bible. If God can restore David, he can restore us. Yes. If this is David's prayer that God answered, guess what? We can pray it and he'll answer it for us. I don't know about you, but I want a clean heart and I want a steadfast spirit. Listen, he goes on and says, Restore, verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. God, I was leaping and dancing before you when we were bringing in the ark. And then I was laying on my couch and walking on my roof. What happened? Restore to me the joy. I got bored. I got prideful. I want to delight in you. I, want to, I don't want to be satisfied in my flesh. I want to be satisfied in you, God. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. It actually says your salvation. And sustain me with a willing spirit. Whew. God, help me be willing. I don't, I don't even have desire. So I don't even have the want to sometimes. But I want to want to. Give me a willing spirit, God. Teachable, moldable. Now here's the key. Once you give me a clean heart, a steadfast spirit, the joy and the willingness, then... Right? You have the if-then principle. God, if you'll do this, then you'll enable me to teach wrongdoers your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Even our testimony of brokenness and all of that, God's saying, I want to use that to draw others to me. I want to show others my redemptive power through you. And he says this, save me from the guilt of bloodshed. I'm sure the guilt was just so heavy on David. He committed adultery. He had a man murdered, and then his own son died as a result. The guilt of that. I'm the king of Israel that established the kingdom. All this history leading up to this, and this is how I treated it. The guilt of that must have been intense. But David's saying, you can save me from the guilt. I don't have to feel the heaviness of this anymore. You can unburden me from the guilt. God, the God of my salvation. And he says, then, another then. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips so that my mouth may declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise, you will not turn away. Barrenness, boredom, brokenness. This is what we need to pray. Let's stand again. We need to enter into this. We need to pray this. We need to confess. Remember, the key is acknowledging and confessing. Hey, I know you're old and tired. It's okay. You can stand and sit. Stand and sit. It's okay. Go to Catholic church. Go to a Methodist church. Find out how they do it there. It's a lot of up and down. <laughs> I tell you, it's amazing what we can do at football games. It's amazing what we can do in movie theaters for three hours. But we can't stand and sit and worship for an hour in church. We can't engage in prayer for longer than two minutes. What? Are we spiritually barren? Are we spiritually bored? 
If we are, it's okay. There's grace. There's no condemnation. There's no shame or no guilt. This is a new day. This is a new season. God wants to create in us a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit. Come on, let's pray. Father, create in me a clean heart. Oh, Father, I want to be pure. I want to be real. I want to be genuine. I want to be poured out before you. I want to be open. I don't, I, the chambers of my heart, I want, to, I want to give you access, full access. Jesus, have your way. Holy Spirit, search me and know me. Test me and try me. See if there be any wicked way. And renew within me a steadfast spirit. God, I want to be in step with you. I want to be in sync with you. I want to be one with you. Keep me steady, God. Give me grace to run this race. Give me grace to keep my eyes on you, the author and finisher. Oh, God, clean hands and pure hearts. This is what we want. It's what we desire. And it's what you will willingly give. Help us to, to receive it. We need your presence, God. Let there be a desperation for your presence. Like there was with Moses, like there was with David. Oh, Father. And in your presence, God, when you pour out your presence, you said at your right hand, our pleasures are reward. In your presence is fullness of joy. Return to us the joy of your salvation. Return to us that first love, passion. God, we want to delight in you. The way that you get glorified through us is when we are satisfied in you, when we boast in you, when we testify about you with joy and thanksgiving. God, give us a willingness, a willingness to press in, to push past the crowd, to get out of the window. Oh, Father, remove the guilt from us. Anyone in this room right now, Father, that's under the weight of sin and shame and guilt. We break it off in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood. We thank you. There's a clean slate today. There's robes of righteousness, white and clean today. Oh, thank you, Lord, that when we feel clean, we live clean. Oh, Father, even now in our heart and our soul, cleanness, our conscience being clean, sprinkled with the blood. Nothing hindering, nothing holding back. Right now, Father, the tongue that David said, my tongue will joyfully sing. He said, open my lips. God, open our lips that our mouths would declare your praises. Loose our tongues, Father, to declare the glory of the Lord. To speak, Father, what you're saying. To decree and declare the things from the throne room that are on your heart. And your kingdom would come and your will would be done. And we would share, Father, the story of redemption. Oh, Father, loose our lips, open our mouths in this place to praise you, to pour out our worship. Oh, Father, to declare your greatness. King of majesty, King of glory. Open our lips so that we may declare your praise. Release joy in the house of God. Release joy. There's a delight. There's a delight that can be found in basking in your mercy and in your presence. In just letting go. Releasing our worship to you. Just from a place of broken. That's all you want. Even in our brokenness, our broken heart. Even in our mess, that's, that's the sacrifice you want. It's just us saying, here it is, got a light on the altar. Send your fire on this. <laughs> you get beauty for ashes. Here's my ashes. Turn it around, God. Take us from spiritual barrenness and spiritual boredom to brokenness. Before you. Where we're just unshackled. We're just unashamed, unhindered, undone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Thank you guys for engaging with me. I'm, I'm so encouraged to hear your voices, to be with you in times like this.
There's just a, there's a, a residing power. There's a sustaining power when we do this together. And I feel it when we pray together. God, I mean, think about this. He took David from being this lowly shepherd boy that nobody else gave a second thought about to being this giant slayer, conquering king. And even after all this journey with God, after all the different things that had happened, David fell. David had been lovingly and miraculously brought into his destiny, and he fell. I'm telling you, you've know, you got to get out of the pride. We've got to get out of the complacency. David fell. That means we can fall. We have to stay in a place of engaging in the battle. We have to make war. We have to worship. We have to praise. But God restored him. Even through all of that, yet God restored him. Not only that, he called him a man after his own heart. And he promised him a throne that would endure forever. David had been given everything. He threw it away. God said, that's okay, buddy. You're still a man after my heart. There's still going to be a throne that my son Jesus is going to reign on. Think about that. God, I'm, one, I'm saying this to say that God is raising up Davids in this hour. God is raising up worshiping warriors who will live this lifestyle of humility, repentance, and passion. He's raised, This is what David was. He lived a lifestyle of humility, repentance, and passion. And who delight to do God's will in all their generation. That's what it was said of David, that he delighted to do his will in his generation. Ultimately, Jesus would fulfill that. If David was the one who got to say, God, I'm delighted to do your will in all my generation. Isn't that amazing that David was so clean and so confident in God that in the end that he was able to say, God, I was able to do all of your will in my generation. Don't you want to be able to have that relationship with God, that confidence before God? God, I was able to leave it all out on the field, to pour it all out, to do all of your will in my generation. I'm telling you, we're made for more than boredom and barrenness. We're made for war. I want to give you some scriptures for this and then we're going to end. We're made to war against sin and darkness and we're made to war for righteousness, truth, love, and justice. So we're made for it. And when we step out of that purpose and our design that God gave us, we can't function. We're going to get all kinds of off and haywire and all this other stuff is going to come into play. Got to align ourselves with this. Hebrews 12 verse 4 says, You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Striving against sin. That word is it's a wrestling. It's a, it's a pressing. It's a fight. It's a, it's a war. It's a battle. It was talking about Jesus who did shed his blood and laid down his life, even for his enemies and for sinners. And he's saying, you need to consider him who endured such hostility and yet for the joy set before him endured the cross because you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood against your striving against sin, but you should be striving against it. 1 Peter 2 verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and strangers. In other words, on this earth, you're, this is not your home. As foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. There are fleshly lusts that wage war against us. Do we even realize we're in a battle? Galatians says that every day our choices are never free from the conflict of spirit and flesh. So he says walk by the spirit so you'll not fulfill the desires of the flesh. If you don't walk by the spirit, guess what's going to happen? As a result, you will fulfill the desires of the flesh. There's a war going on. These things wage war against us. What are we doing to fight? Because if we don't, they will take over. 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, But flee from these things, you man of God. And he's talking about the love of money and power and influence right before that. He says, Flee from these things, you man of God. And what should you pursue? What should you be fighting for? Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Listen, our faith is a fight. It's, it's, and it's a good fight, it says. It's a good fight. It's a good thing. It's what you were made for. You have a purpose. You have a calling. You have a destiny. But you're going to have to fight for it. 
And God will be with you, and it'll be glorious. There'll be ups and downs and seasons and this and that. But I promise you, you will not regret following Christ on that narrow road. Pursue it. Fight for it. It's one thing to say no to some things, but we've got to say yes to some things. It's not either or. It's both and. I'm saying no to this and yes to you, Jesus. Even Jesus himself in Luke 13, 24, he says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. They didn't know about the warfare. They didn't know how to get into brokenness. They got spiritually bored and spiritually barren. Strive to enter through the narrow door, Jesus said. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 28 and 29 says, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. It's possible to be presented before the Lord complete. This should give us hope, right? For this purpose, listen to what he says, I also I labor, striving according to his power. See, I strive, not according to my power, but his power, which mightily works within me. There's a partnership that's happening. Once again, we know the Holy Spirit is jealously yearning for us. He's warring on our behalf to join in. Philippians, this is the last one. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Don't we want to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are. Listen to what he says. That you're standing firm. He's talking to the church at Philippi. That you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We're in this thing together. He says, strive together. Which, once again, you're wrestling. You're, it's, it's, it's like a, you're competing to win the prize. And Paul would say that, right? In Corinthians He's like, run the race, train your body, discipline yourself to win the prize. Like you're, 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 you're in this race, you're in this fight. Strive together, stand firm in one spirit with one mind. It's so important that we wage war on these issues. We get rid of the religion, the pride, the judgment, the criticism, all the things that we talked about. Got to get back to the faith. The gospel, simple and purity, the devotion to Jesus. Now, I was going to read Psalm 46. I encourage you to read that on your own. Instead, I want to read in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 19. This is how we're going to end. Let's stand to our feet one more time as we read Revelation 19. This is a, a powerful scripture. This is how we're going to end today. You got your exercise, your workout, maybe a little bit of the start of it. Somebody's going to bust out in a run one of these days. <laughs> it's going to be good. And I will be like, go, 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 go. Revelation 19. So here we see this, this fourfold hallelujah that's being proclaimed by elders and angels and saints. God has come. He's poured out his judgments. And they're declaring that God is righteous and true. They're worshiping him. Like you brought the storyline to an end. You're victorious. Thank you, God, that you're establishing your kingdom on the earth. Now look at this. Now he talks about the marriage of the Lamb. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad. In verse 7, that we were given uh, robes, fine linen. There's that linen again, bright and clean. For the linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now look at verse 11. And I saw heaven open. This is Jesus now. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And listen to this. And in righteousness he judges and what? Makes war. Wages war. This is Jesus at the end of all things. At the, at the very culmination of history. Human history. This age that we know it. This natural age is coming to a close. And here's how Jesus decides to come on the scene. As a warrior, a white warrior, not Gandalf. <laughs> We're talking about Jesus. Gandalf is a warrior, the white elf. That's great. 
This is where all that comes from. All that Lord of the Rings stuff is inspired by the real thing. Hello. He's displayed as a white warrior on a white horse who in righteousness judges and makes war. Now listen to this, verse 12. His, uh, we need to get this picture of Jesus. This is who we come to worship. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, which are crowns. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. Man, let me find that name. Let me search Jesus until I find that name. Nobody knows it. I want to know it. I want to know you in an intimate way. You know, Jesus is going to give us a white stone with a name written on it that no one else knows. That's really one of the rewards of the book of Revelation. He's going to give us a white stone with a name written on it just for us. Here, son, this is how I view you. Here's what I call you. Isn't this a beautiful picture? What a beautiful relationship we have with Jesus. Verse 13, he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Uh-oh. It's not the robe that's dipped in the blood of the cross. This is the blood of the nations that he's trampled in his wrath. We don't we look at the nice little lamb of God, Jesus, and the laying down. Here he is now as a roaring lion. I'm trying to awaken the warrior in you. That's 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 what the Holy Spirit is called me to do with this. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And you can't argue with the Word of God. Why is your robe dipped in blood, Jesus? I thought you were a God of love and mercy, not a God of wrath and judgment. But I'm the Word of God, and this is what I did. You're either for me or you're not. You're either in agreement or you're not. This is who I am. And I'm righteous, and I judge, and I make war. Are you with me or not? You guys hearing me here? Now listen to this. Here's where we come in. Verse 14. And the armies. Somebody say armies. armies. We're talking about angels and we're talking about saints. Human beings with resurrected glorified bodies. We are in that army. In the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen. It just got through saying what? That we were clothed in fine linen. That's you and me. That's us with Jesus. At the end of this thing. And they were following him on white horses. Jesus has a white robe dipped in blood. We have horses and robes white following him. Isn't this amazing? He's elevated us to that level of intimacy and partnership with him. To ride with him. This is what he's created us for. This is where things are going to that moment with him where he triumphs over all his enemies. And all the wrong things are made right. This is what all the prophets have been waiting. It's all been leading up to this. Come on, warriors. It's time to wake up. Verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. That's Jesus doing the Father's will, actually. 16, and on his robe and on his thigh. Oh man, Jesus is tatted up, man. He has another name written right here. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What an awesome day to look at him and to see that tattoo, or whatever that's going to be. There he is. There's Jesus, our Savior, our Warrior King. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 17, then I saw an angel standing in the sun. Oh man, that, 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 you're not ready for that. You can read the rest of it on your own. <laughs> it's, not, it's not enough for this whole scene. Now there's going to be an angel standing in the sun? Wow. I'm saying all this, and I encourage you to go back and read Psalm 46 as well. And that's where we get the song, Lord of Hosts, right? That's where this, that, that song is where that song comes from. This is who our God is. And I believe that he is exposing apathy, complacency, religion, pride, all of that stuff. He's exposing it so that we can deal with it, right? And then awaken 
to that warrior that he's made us to be. Yes, we're weak, we're broken, we're all those things, but in Christ, we're victorious. We can be that pure and spotless bride. We can be one. We can strive together for the faith. All those scriptures, like we pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. We've got to fight for it. We've got to fight for each other. And stop fighting over the stupid, minor, petty stuff that doesn't matter and start fighting for what does matter. And like I said, this isn't toward any one person. I'm not saying that there's such division in this church. Anything like that. Don't, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying any of that. All I'm saying is, is God is calling us higher into this. There's an invitation. That's all it is. And I'm going to speak truth. My job is not to sit here and stroke our egos and do a seeker-friendly thing and light a nice church service. No, it's to light a fire in us. That's what it is. Yes, I will comfort and I will encourage and all of that, but I'm also supposed to correct and rebuke and call it challenge, right? That's what we do as leaders. We do both. In fact, when you look at what Paul writes about fulfill your work as an evangelist, give yourself Timothy, he talks about rebuking and correcting first before he gets into the other stuff. You've got to rebuke and correct, Timothy, my son in the faith. And all I'm saying is God is maturing us. You know, it's the way that he did with the people of God through the wilderness. They went from being slaves in Egypt to being sons in the wilderness to being soldiers in the promised land. That's it. That's our journey from slavery to sons to soldiers. That's what I'm calling us to. Is this resonating with anybody at all?